from the very start I was meant to leave I am waiting in a quiet place longing for a place Lord I love to be faithful to reveal your heart from the very start I was meant to leave is over me for eternity I just want to see You hold my world inside your hands. You are my inheritance. You hold my world inside your hands. teach this heart to love like you. Open these hands to heal the way you do. More 
than words let my life speak truth to the mountain can't be moved they say these chains will never break but they don't know you like we do there is power in your name we've heard that there is no way
Well, good morning, everybody. Why don't we stand together? So good to be with you this morning. Want to set our hearts in motion today. Psalm 89 frames up this God that we get to sing to today. It says, let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is as mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. Amen. We get to worship the God, that faithfulness is who he is, but it surrounds the very character and nature of who he is. And so let's lift up our voice, let's lift up our shout, let's lift up our worship to a God who is faithful this morning. Amen? Amen.
find my honor to have the helper at my side the gift was fully purchased when the lamb was crucified so now freely i can ask him for his blood has washed me clean let the dove of heaven rest upon the christ in me the dove of heaven rests upon the Christ in me.
The Spirit of the Lord is in this place. Today is Pentecost Sunday. And Pentecost Sunday is, in Acts chapter 2, it says that the, the Holy Spirit rested and filled them. Those disciples, those waiting for the promise. You know, it was a benefit that Jesus left so that the Holy Spirit can come in us. Pentecost is a day of celebration because it's where the church was birthed. And it's where the Spirit of God came and filled his people. It's at Bethlehem in the manger that it was God with us. It was on the cross at Calvary that it was God for us. But it was at Pentecost where he became God in us. And just as we've been declaring and singing about the dove resting on the Christ in us, you know, you and I, we, we need the Holy Spirit. There is no Christian life without the Holy Spirit. Uh, the church without the Holy Spirit is either a social club or just some institution. We need the Spirit of God like we need breath in our lungs, everybody. Uh, there's no love without the Holy Spirit. There's no joy without the Holy Spirit. There's no power without the Holy Spirit. There's no revelation without the Holy Spirit. There's no freedom without the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians says that, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The Holy Spirit isn't Someone to be afraid of. The Holy Spirit isn't an emotion. The Holy Spirit isn't an it. It's the very presence and the very wind and the very breath and the very person of God. And we need him in our lives. We need him in our families. We need him in our church. We need him in our city. We need him in this nation. And I just even believe right now that there's maybe some of you right now that you would say, man, I need, a, I need to be filled again with the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul says to be filled with the Spirit, and the word filled means and be being filled. Because there's things that happen in our lives where we need a fresh empowerment of the Spirit of God. And so I just want to pray for those of us today. Maybe you feel like the wind got knocked out of you as you walked into the room today. And you're running on fumes. You need a, this is a filling station today, right in this room, everybody. And I just want to ask, if that's you today, if you want to be refreshed today, if you want a, a new filling of the Spirit of God, I just want you, right now, every head bowed, I just want you to put your arms out like this, and I just want to pray. That's all I want to do. If that's you, just all across the room, just as you're receiving, just, just as they receive the Spirit of God in Acts chapter 2, we're going to receive the Spirit today in a fresh way, in a new way. So, Father, we come in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that, that as you did it before, God, you would do it again. And as you fill the disciples that day, would you come this day right now and fill your people, God? Fill us to overflowing with the Spirit of God. I pray for fresh wind and fresh fire from heaven to fill the people of God right now. We ask for a fresh touch, God. Would you encourage us right now by the Spirit of God? Would you empower us right now by the Spirit of God? Would joy come and fill the hearts of every person by the Spirit of God? Lord, I pray that there would, there would be a power from on high that fills the people of God in this room right now. God, would you give us a, a new encounter and revelation of the love of Jesus Christ? May you glorify Jesus in us once again right now, God. And Lord, I ask that there would be a sweeping presence of God that fills this room that fills this city and fills this nation and that you would turn this city upside down. God, would you do a new and fresh work in the hearts of your people right now that need a fresh touch? May the wind of heaven come. We hoist our sails and we say, wind of God, blow. Holy Spirit, come. Come. Holy Spirit, come. 
Maybe you just want to just declare that today. Holy Spirit, come. Just pray that right now. Holy Spirit, come. He comes where he's wanted. Holy Spirit, come. God, we thank you for your church. We thank you for the body of Christ. And we thank you that the Spirit of God is alive and well. Give us a better awareness and a greater awareness. Increase our awareness and our sensitivity to the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said amen. Can we give Jesus some praise in the room today? Amen. Amen. Well, it's so good to be with you this morning. Hey, if you could uh, turn to your neighbor, greet them this morning, and we'll continue with service. Good morning, Church of the City. How are we doing? Yeah, we here? We alive? Well, amen. Praise the Lord. I don't know about you. After that worship, that moment, thank you, Pastor Tony. My spirit's just stirred on to continue pressing on. So um, if you're new here to Church of the City, we haven't met before. Uh, my name is J.R. Benton, and um, we probably haven't met before because I've never been up here on this platform before. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, so I serve on staff as our director of production. So basically that just means that myself and my team, we get to utilize all things technology to help support ministry and share the gospel. Um, so I can happily say I'm living the dream. Um, so I have just a couple announcements here for you today. Uh, first up, there are two teams that I want to make you aware of. Uh, we have a Next Steps team that would love to meet you. If you are new here to Church of the City or you just have questions about what is church? What does Church of the City believe? Who is Jesus? What's this Holy Spirit that we're talking about? Uh, right out these double doors back here on the left, there's going to be a table with someone waiting to meet you there. And we actually have a gift waiting there for you as well. So feel free, free to stop by there on the way out. And the second team that I'd love to make you aware of is our prayer team. At Church of the City, uh, I, I think hopefully it's obvious, but we believe in the power of prayer. Not only out of the overflow of our own love for God, but because we've seen what God can do through the power of prayer. So if you find yourself in a place today where you just feel like you need prayer, you'd like to share with someone, to share your burdens with someone, we have a prayer room also right out the back on the left uh, to meet with you and to pray for uh, for you in that. Okay, uh, next announcement. Uh, coming up in the fall, where are the ladies at Church of the City at? Are we here? We here? Come on, you can do it. Okay. So uh, coming up in the fall, something for you to note is we have a women's retreat coming up. Now, this is going to be an awesome time for you to get away, to get together with other ladies of Church of the City and seek after the presence of the Lord. Um, so this is going to happen on September 15th through 16th, and spots are going to be filling up pretty quickly. So I'd encourage you to go ahead, scan the QR code on the screens or on the seat back in front of you to uh, register your spot. And uh, just one thing about this retreat, while I do firmly believe that God can speak to us any moment, any minute, any second, any hour of any day, I do think there's something vitally important to our walk with the Lord whenever we consecrate and spend intentional time pursuing after him. So I would say even leading up to this weekend, this women's retreat weekend, praying, God, I want to know you more. I want to build new friendships. I want to meet new people and grow in my faith with you. And I promise you, he'll meet you there. So scan the QR code and get your retreat on. Okay, now we're going to enter into our time of offering. Uh, if you came today uh, prepared to give, there are a few ways that you can do that. Uh, you can give in the offering boxes at the back of the room. You can also give at uh, cotc.com forward slash give or on the COTC app if you have that. And just one thing about offering, offering is not just the practice of filling out a check and putting it in a box or typing in numbers on a phone and sending that through. What you're actually doing is you're fueling Church of the City to operate as a ministry and to go past the four walls of this church to be the hands and feet of Jesus to love in our community. Um, I know for myself a little bit about uh, my family. Uh, my wife and I, Anna, we are foster and adoptive parents. 
And uh, we felt the call of the Lord to move to the promised land of uh, Spring Hill, Tennessee, uh, <laughs> uh, probably about a year and a half ago now. And um, we just completely felt wrapped around by the Church of the City wraparound team whenever we, we came here. Um, we were able to walk our, our children through the Fostering Hope event that happens yearly. And we were able to get Christmas gifts for our, our children, warm clothes. And that's all due to your generosity and the way that you give so sacrificially. So thank you for that. And so today, we're going to keep on pressing on in our series, Digital Detox. This is actually the last Sunday. Uh, I don't know about you, but my relationship with my devices has been pretty flipped upside down in a good way. Um, so let's give a warm welcome to Pastor Brendan Owen as he comes to preach. Can you guys give it up for JR who just crushed host time? Oh my gosh. That was amazing. Hey, uh... Just want to say welcome. Good morning. It's great to be with you guys all today. Uh, my name is Brandon. I'm one of the pastors here, and I love and cherish the opportunities to just get up here and talk about God's Word with you. Uh, one thing I want to do real quick is if you are uh, a veteran or a family member of a veteran, today is Memorial Day weekend, and it's a day that we want to actually just honor those that have given their lives for the ultimate uh, sacrifice for our freedom. And so if you are a family member of a veteran or a veteran in the room, will you just stand up so we can honor you this morning? <laughs> we so appreciate your sacrifice and all that you've done for our country. Uh, today, like JR said, is our final Sunday of digital detox, okay? I, I'm, there's, I'm not joking when I tell you this has maybe been one of the most challenging movements I've been a part of in my church experience from being a teenager to now. Uh, it has been really challenging for me personally. So uh, one thing I want to just highlight, if you engaged in this series, or even if you didn't, if, if, for those of you guys that are new, in the month of May, we basically said we're going to do a digital media fast. And so we're going to, at some level, uh, choose to take technology and put it in a different space, whether that was your phone or social media or maybe, you know, technology at home, how you do work, all of that stuff. And so uh, there were different ways to engage in it. And we just kind of want to know how that went, how the, how was, how's that going? Like, what, what was that experience like for you? And so we're actually going to be sending out a survey later this week where you can just say, hey, this is the level I engaged in this. This is maybe some of the learnings that I got from it. This is what the Lord was teaching me. Maybe you had some moments where God was speaking to you. We just want to hear about those and, uh, and just kind of collectively get, get a gauge on where we are as a church in regards to technology. So if you wouldn't mind filling that out, I think it should come out later this week. Just look out for that in your emails um, and fill that out. That will be a great service to our church as we move forward. All right. So in light of that, I do want to tell you guys a story. Um, just a couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go back home. I'm originally from Las Vegas, Nevada. Anyone from Las Vegas in here? Yeah, there you guys are. What up? It's, it's us. Um, and uh, my, my sister was graduating, and so she's graduating college, so I just went home for the weekend to just, you know, have the graduation party and celebrate her and, and do, do all that. Uh, but it was digital detox, okay? So there was a five-hour plane ride where I just sat there and did nothing. Like, I had a book. I did that for maybe 30 minutes, and I was like, this is just so painful. And then I went and hung out with my family with no cell phone. I didn't walk away and go watch anything on the television. For the first time in my entire adult life, I was fully present with my extended family for over 24 hours, okay? And that might be a dream for some of you. And if you're watching family, it was great. Um, but really, it was really difficult. It was really difficult, okay? I'm going to be pretty vulnerable here and tell you a story that I'm, I'm really embarrassed about. So it's my sister's graduation party, and uh, I show up kind of like in the middle of it because I was hanging out with my dad somewhere else. And uh, I show up, I have glasses on, and I had a mustache at the time, so no one recognized me. So I just kind of walked into this party, don't have my cell phone, I walk in, and then I just kind of stand there for 15 minutes maybe with my entire extended family there, and no one like 
just even really acknowledge my presence, which was fine. But what got worse was I, I, I took off my glasses, and then people started to realize, oh, hey, what's up? You're here. Great. I'm like, yeah. Uh, I realized I'm not good in these situations. Like, I'm not good in a social setting. I could kind of be a little awkward. It was my own family, right? So this is the story. This is how it gets really bad. It's, yeah. My, I have a cousin. He's younger than me. And uh, he's got like this kind of big bushy beard. So he comes up to me and he's like, hey, I didn't think, hey, how's it going? I didn't think you'd recognize me because of the beard. I was like, oh, no, I, yeah, I know who you are. That's cool. And so we're just doing the, you know, just the thing where you're like, God, how's your life? And what do you do again? And it's just doing that thing, right? And so, you know, he, he had the courage to come up and, and talk to me and, and seek me out and ask me about my life, which was cool. And, uh, you know, he obviously had some kind of like, you wouldn't re- remember me moment. And so, I kid you not, the conversation is ending. And we're both trying to figure a way out of this, right? And so we're, we, we, we have the moment, and the conversation is over, basically. And I look him in the eyes, and I say, it was nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> like, my brain just, like, shut off. This digital detox just, like, made me, I, I'm not even human anymore. I don't know what's happening. But I just was like, what did you just say to this kid? And he, he didn't know what to do, so he's just like, uh, uh. I, oh, I was supposed to go this way. And literally, like, he just, I was like, I just walked upstairs. I left the party. Like, I didn't know what else to do because it was so uncomfortable and so awkward. And, oh, man, if you're family, if you're watching, I love you. But it was just really interesting as I reflect back on it. Like, oh, man, my phone is such a helpful tool in those moments where I get uncomfortable, I get awkward because I can just, I can zone out, right? My kids weren't there, and my wife wasn't there, and they are always like my saviors in those moments. And so without them, without my phone, I was just fully in every moment present, and I realized that is uh, really challenging for me, and I can get kind of uncomfortable. But here's the biggest thing that I, I realized in all of that was actually more that when I walked in, and I was at the party, and I was watching my family kind of like a fly on the wall, I realized as much as I love them, they love me, we support each other, we have each other's backs, they weren't my community anymore. And that's an okay thing. Like, it was something I was like, oh man, that's so interesting. Like, I didn't even know about some of the things that they were talking about, like just sharing life, telling inside jokes, like all this stuff. And it was like, wow, this is, this is my family, but this is not my community. And in that moment, Without my, fam- my family, my wife and my kids there, without a phone to run to, I felt lonely. Felt lonely. The reality for a lot of us is we're all feeling lonely. Loneliness is at an all-time high in our world, but specifically in America, we show the greatest symptoms of chronic loneliness. A couple of thoughts, just real quick, some data. Three in five Americans, as 61%, report feeling lonely, compared to more than half, 54%, only just in 2018, so a few years ago. Younger generations are lonelier than older generations. Nearly 8 in 10 Gen Zers, 79%, and 7 in 10 Millennials, 71%, report feeling lonely. Versus half, 50%, of Boomers reporting the same thing. It's interesting to even think about when technology and social media and having a phone on your your person at all times came into play is in the millennial age range. And then we have the now digital natives of the Gen Zs. The former Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murphy, he said the most common pathology that he encountered wasn't heart disease or diabetes, but loneliness as the reason for a lot of the medical problems he saw. Harvard Magazine reports that the heightened risk of mortality from loneliness equals that of smoking 15 cigarettes a day or being an alcoholic. The Aspen Institute reports that the lonely people likely become ill, experience cognitive decline, and die earlier. And then lastly, um, from the, the people at Gallup, they 
define it as Americans are among the most loneliest people in the world. Just to describe our current dynamic. Now, I want to make a distinction here, right? Because what I think that they're talking about and the issues and the, the, you know, the health problems that come from this and the cognitive problems, all those things, I think it actually comes from unchecked and unacknowledged loneliness. Not just loneliness itself, right? Loneliness is an emotion just like any other feeling that we have. You get angry, you get sad, you get glad. Like those, you're, you're afraid. Those are normal emotions, feelings, that God has given to us for a reason. The reality that maybe some of us need to recognize this morning is that loneliness actually can be a gift. Loneliness can be a gift. God gave us loneliness so that we would seek out what we truly need in relationships. Loneliness is our deep hunger to belong and be known. That's what it is. It's the check engine light on your car. It's saying, hey, you need relationships. You need to be known. You need to belong. And it's a healthy, worthwhile desire that God has given all of us. And so loneliness comes in and shows us, hey, you're, you, you long for this. You need this. You want this. And where technology becomes like the master manipulator is it, it gets in and convinces us to not press in and acknowledge the loneliness, but to medicate it and undermine it by going to technology, by looking to a screen, by even searching for relationships through the internet, through social media, as if that could solve the pain of the loneliness we feel. Instead of reaching out, Maybe you've, you've gone to a party. There's a bunch of graduation parties happening all this week. I've been to like 15, all right? Maybe you're at one of those and you can feel that loneliness creep up. And instead of reaching out and being courageous and maybe pressing into a conversation, honestly, like my cousin came to me, like that was, it takes courage. Instead of doing that, you reach towards infinity in your hand, right? What you have at your disposal. Chip Dodd is uh, kind of like a Christian counselor. He wrote a book on the eight core emotions. I strongly recommend it. It's, it's worthwhile read. Here is his part on loneliness. I want you to read this. It's actually two parts, okay? When my oldest son was about three, I remember showing him his first rainbow. Instead of stopping in the wonder of it, he began walking toward it saying, Take me there, Daddy. His heart was lonely, longing to be more a part of the beauty. He valued it. When he found out that I couldn't take him there, he ached in his waiting for what he could not have complete or could not completely have, but what he knew he was made for. I just want you to sit with that for a second. Has there been something that you have longed for, that you've ached in who you are? knowing that you belong to this thing, and maybe you can't even articulate it, can't even maybe define it, but it's just this thing, that like, I'm missing something here, All right? He goes on to say, loneliness renders us vulnerable to our hunger for emotional and spiritual fulfillment, thus exposing us to all relationships' needs. But in a world that screams negativity about dependency and glorifies self-sufficiency, loneliness is the feeling that we work the hardest to avoid. The irony is that the more we work to avoid it, the more it occurs. The more we work to hide it, the more we miss out on life. Irony being we truly long for to be known, to belong, it shows up in our loneliness, and because we're embarrassed or ashamed or, you know, we think we should just get over it or it's no big deal, and we minimize and we undermine and we run away from and avoid the true longing of our heart, pushing it further and further away to be known and to belong. So loneliness isn't the issue. It's unchecked and unacknowledged loneliness. It's ignored loneliness. It's medicated 
loneliness that is our problem in our modern day. See, God's design for us all along was to be known by him and belong with him. Ever since the garden, God has been on mission to restore his community, to restore right relationship with us. God's plan was always real community where people could be the truest version of themselves, naked and unashamed. Now, we don't have to do the naked part, but we can do the real community part. We can do the true self. So just like Tony started this series at the beginning of May, where we take spiritual practices and we look at the life of Jesus, if we want the life of Jesus, we have to embody his lifestyle, right? We can't have all the things of Jesus without being and doing the things that he did. So we've been looking at all these spiritual practices. Today, I want to look at Jesus' spiritual practice of real community. You know, because Jesus often retreated and, and got alone. And, you know, JR even talked to the, the value of, of like a women's retreat and getting, and getting in that space, right? And Jesus, all the time, got alone by himself in silence, in solitude, right? And then when he wasn't, he was in community, In fact, all of the spiritual practices, even the ones we've talked about where Christy was talking about Sabbath and celebration or prayer, all of these other spiritual practices, they hang on the two realities of silence and solitude and community. That if we get these two right, all the others are going to fall into place. But we need the spiritual practice of community. And so I want to look at the life of Jesus. I want to look at what he did, right? So if you, I'm just going to do a quick timeline. We're going to fly through this. All right. So if you know some of like the Gospels and kind of the narrative and what plays out, the actual timeline of events, Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days. Silence and solitude. He defeats the enemy and temptation and all of that, right? In that quiet place with the Lord, in the wilderness. He then immediately goes from there and travels back to Nazareth. This is Luke chapter 4. He goes back to Nazareth where his hometown is. Like, these are the people he grew up with, right? So this would be his version of the graduation party in Las Vegas, right? He's going to the people he knows, the people who know him, people he went to school with. And what I think Jesus is doing is he's stopping there first to recruit his community, his team, his new family that he's going to walk with and live out the kingdom of God on the earth and his mission on, on, on the earth. Now that's where he's going to recruit his team. That's where he's going to define his community is back in his hometown. He wants to start with them first. And what's interesting in the story, what happens is Jesus shows up. He goes to temple, which is often a practice for him. He, he lived in the community, right? He operated in the community. Goes to temple. They hand him the scroll of Isaiah which is speaking prophetically about the Messiah, he says that the, the time for this is now. Like the, the, the joy of the Lord, like what God's gonna do, he's gonna save his people, it's happening right now and it's happening through me. And they're, they're, they're all in astonishment. They're in, they're in awe and wonder of this. And they, they've, they've heard of Jesus doing miracles. They've heard of Jesus doing crazy things. And so they actually have this kind of, this thought, that what, if we, what if we were like the insiders in what Jesus was doing? What if, we, what if we had first priority? What if we could get the privileges of already knowing Jesus and we can get him to do the things we want him to do? And so Jesus senses that this is happening and he challenges them. He's like, no, that's not how this works. The kingdom of God is for all people. And then he basically equates them to being as worthy to receive the kingdom as the Gentiles, who were their cultural opponents, their enemies, the people that they despise, they hate it. So Jesus shows up in his hometown, is telling them first that the kingdom of God is about to show up through him, giving them an opportunity to join in his community, in his team, to advance the gospel on the earth. They want to abuse it and use it for their own privileges and rights and priorities or whatever. He challenges them, and so they take him violently to a cliff, to throw him off, to then stone him to death. So I just want you to just realize this for a second. 
Jesus' hometown, family, original community that he grew up with. These are his people. They know him. And they utterly and violently reject him. So if that's you and me, are we going to go with this idea of community? Like they should have been the easiest ones to say, yes, I'm in. I want to see what God's going to do through you, Jesus. And they, che- they, they were out. That would, to me, make me go, yeah, that's not, that's not a good plan. Community isn't it. It's not the move. Like, let's go a different route. In fact, you know what? I'm going to do this by myself. Can't trust people. I'm, I'm, I'm alone in this. Right? But that's the totally opposite of what Jesus does. Crazy that, is that the people in Nazareth, they wanted to see Jesus do a miracle. He does one. He actually escapes them without anyone touching him. It's crazy. We don't know exactly what happens, but they're literally about to kill him, and he's just like, no, not anymore. And he just walks away. Like, I don't know how he did that. Miracle. So they got to see one. He then goes in where we see in Matthew chapter 4 and then 9 and 10 is he's gathering this new team, this new community. He goes and gets the disciples. He finds Peter and Andrew. They're fishing. He says, come and follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And that's not a pun. That's not him being funny. That's like, I'm going to, it's a, a Jewish idiom of the time where it really meant, I'm going to teach you a way to capture the hearts and minds of the people. I'm going to show you how to build this community. Come and and live my lifestyle. And they're like, yeah, I want in on that. They leave everything. They follow Jesus. He gets James and John. He gets Matthew, the tax collector. And in Matthew chapter 10, you kind of see the culminating moment. We see the 12 disciples. Now, I have not been on digital media and I have attempted to, to read the book, Lord of the Rings. I'm like 50 pages in, and it took me all month, okay? <laughs> so it's really challenging. But as I'm reading it, and I'm, I'm like, uh, it's, if you've read the book, I'm like in the Tom Balbody part, and I'm like, I don't even know what's happening, because all I know is the movies, right? And so I'm just thinking the movies in my head the entire time I read this book. And so... I, I read this moment in Matthew 10. I'm like, this is the fellowship of the ring, man. Like, this is, this is like the moment when they're like, we're going to destroy the ring and mortar. And some of you guys are like, I picked the nerd day to go to church. Like, I'm sorry. But that was, it's like this epic moment where the disciples are like, this is it. This is the team. This is the community. And when you start to read the descriptions of the members of the community, it's not the A team. It's not the B team. It's like the Z team. Like these guys are, are the outcasts. They're the, they're, they're the oddballs. And they're amongst them is so much tension and disagreement. And like the spectrum of where they were politically and culturally, economically, it was all over the place. Which just shows us that Jesus just picked people who were willing to commit to community. It didn't matter their maturity level. It didn't matter what they were defined as sinners or not. It just mattered, were they going to be in on what Jesus was going to do? And across all these different divides, and I'm sure breakfast most mornings with these guys were pretty difficult, right? Like you have that one hour at Thanksgiving with that one uncle talking about politics, and you're like, I got to get out of here, right? Like that was every morning with Jesus and the disciples, Every, every conversation was probably an issue, a disagreement. What do we do about money? How should we respond to the government? This person that we interacted with, do they have value? Like all of the things was probably an argument. But this was his team. This was his community. So a couple things. Jesus modeled community life. He built his team after facing the most, most ultimate rejection. He didn't give up on the concept. They were completely opposite, and Jesus was their only commonality. And it seems to me to follow Jesus is synonymous with being in community. So if you're in here today and you're like, man, I'm trying to follow Jesus, outside of community, it's just not going to happen. Like, 
biblically, you can't do it. You can't live out the tenets and ways and practices of Jesus without being around people. And then Jesus leaves. He gets this community. He gets this team together. He's like, you guys are going to be a part of this. We're going to change hearts and minds of people. The kingdom of God is going to show up. We're going to live a third way. It's going to be radical. It's going to be transformative. By the way, see you later. You guys got this, right? And Tony mentioned Pentecost Sunday. Crazy. I knew it was Pentecost Sunday, but I did not connect the idea of what you're talking about in the text that we're actually going to read this morning. And so we have finally gotten to our text. So I want to invite you guys to stand, if you're able, for the reading of God's Word. That doesn't mean there's like another 30 minutes or anything like that. Um, Here we go. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. This is like the typical verse on community. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Radical, transformative community. The Bible says that God puts the lonely in families. And in Acts 2, day by day, through the power of the Holy Spirit, people keep showing up and keep finding community, and keep finding a home, someone to be a part of, something to be a part of, somewhere to belong. The kingdom community of Jesus is unleashed into the world. And we're here today celebrating Pentecost Sunday together, worshiping the Lord together, talking about how the Holy Spirit has moved throughout time because this community existed. Fully alive, open for people to come and join. They devoted to one another. They practiced, uh, they had spiritual practices that they did together. They ate meals together. They showed radical generosity and service. There were awe and wonder and signs and miracles that accompanied them, right? Which, can we just acknowledge the reality of all of those different types of people getting together in a room and trying to have a meal? That's a miracle, right? So yeah, there were probably healings and prophetic words and all of these things, speaking to all these things, yes, and the miraculous coming together of different people is happening too. And we hear that and we read that and we go, yes, amen, I want that, I want to be in on that. And yet we look at our life and there's a huge discrepancy, right? And so... John Tyson, a pastor in New York, uh, actually Church of the City in New York, he, he took Acts 2.42 and he gave a modern uh, church expression of it. He kind of rewrote it and said, this is what it looks like in our day. All right, this is what it says. This is John Tyson's version of Acts 2.42.47. They studied the apostles' teaching when they had time. They went to fellowship when they could fit it in. They prayed when they needed something and got coffee together every now and then. They were content without and had low expectation for signs and wonders in their midst. That's rough. They sometimes talked about generosity, but kept all of their possessions for themselves. Two out of five Sundays, they came to corporate gatherings. They didn't invite people into their homes and rarely revealed their hearts. They were largely irrelevant to all the people, and occasionally someone was randomly saved. Now, I don't, it's tough to read, and I don't mean that to, that's not to beat us down in any way, right? Like, Jesus loves his church. We love the church, and it has a long way to go in our time. So I want to talk about, we see the Acts 2 framework. We know what it looks like. 
We, we, it's not complicated, right? They got together, they ate together, they prayed together, they gave to one another. I guess we don't have to get super exegetical on it. It's pretty basic, right? There's no, I don't need to go into the Greek word of this thing. Like they just got together and they did the thing, right? So I want to talk about what are our challenges to community. I'm going to fly through these. The first one, individualism. We are the country that invented individualism. If we didn't invent it, we surely proved it. We love individualism. We love the idea of a success story of someone all on their own rising to the top, right? Without maybe even thinking about, well, who are the people that got them there? What are the relationships? Who mentored them? Who coached them? Who? It's community. Ironically, it's this, this experience of individualism when Everything becomes about us, our needs, our preferences. We actually, this is so interesting, we actually start to be sorted into tribes based on our preferences, based on our individualism and how it starts to rise. We get sorted into these groups of this is what we're about. This is what we're against rather than what we're known for, what we're for. A.J. Swoboda puts it this way, today in a world where we can find whole communities of people who think like us, share our values, and have common likes, we are trading in our ethical relationships for peg relationships. Real quick. Peg relationships are like, you have a common experience, so you go to the Taylor Swift concert in Nashville or something, and you have like this overwhelming, like, this is amazing, and all of these people are going to be my family forever, which is like what I heard about people having experiences at the Taylor Swift concert. So that would be like a version of a a peg relationship. The result is troubling. We do not really need to love anybody who is different if we do not feel like it. We can cower in the corner with all the people we agree with. The political cycle is coming up. Elections are coming up. You feel that tension of like, we're just all in our corners. The people we agree with. But we're individualists. It becomes about us. We don't want to be controlled. We don't want to be tied down. We don't want to commit. We don't want to miss out on something. I don't need anyone. Tyson, again, he says it this way. We want easy on-ramps and easy exit ramps without any drama where all our needs are met. And that's how we can often look at the idea of church and community. Where church becomes kind of like, I don't know, like a restaurant. We can leave our Yelp review if we didn't like the worship that day. You know, like, it, 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 starts to, it starts to become like that, as opposed to, no, these are the people of God who God has called us to serve with and love and give our lives for together. It can become about us. All right, the next one, idealism. Idealism. This is where, this is where the dream of what I want in community is actually more important than the community I'm in right? This is where I have expectations. I'm not necessarily communicating those expectations because expectations for a community are a good thing, right? It it fosters accountability. It fosters vulnerability. I'm telling you, I need this. You can tell me whether or not you can meet it or not, right? It just bridges communication and openness. Expectations are good when we talk about them. But idealism is I have all these expectations. I have all these dreams for this place, and you better do it, but I'm not going to tell you what they are or how to do them. Right? I, I, I can be an expert in this. In fact, I had a student a couple weeks ago come up to me. I had made a joke, um, maybe at her expense, but I made a joke, and I, I, was, I was just talking about how she didn't do something. I don't even fully remember, but she came up to me, and she's like, hey, I just want to let you know, like, that hurt my feelings, and, like, Sometimes I think it's hard for people to meet the standards you have for them. I was like, oh, please. Like, this is devastating. It was like right before a Wednesday night where I was like going to have to do a bunch of stuff. I was like, please. It was hard to hear. But I was reminded in that moment that, yeah, my idealism can crush people sometimes. My dreams are what I think things should be, especially if you're a dreamer or a perfectionist or you have like, I just have lots of ideas. If you're that kind of person, like idealism can crush people as opposed to just loving and, and accepting where people are at, where they're at. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, 
who was like the great, you know, kind of rebel in the Third Reich who was trying to build God's church up through this like, this like kind of underground seminary um, to, to just to say like, this has got to be stronger than that, the Third Reich of Nazi Germany. Uh, the way of Jesus has to be stronger than that. He eventually gets captured and, and put in a concentration camp. But like some of the things that he has written about are, are just so profound. And one of the books that he has is uh, Life Together, talking about what the Christian community should look like. And he says this, In New World Times, a whole community has broken down because it had sprung from a wish dream. The serious Christian set down for the first time in a Christian community is likely to bring with him a very definite idea of what Christian life together should be and try to realize it. Right? No, that doesn't sound bad. The sooner the shock of disillusionment comes to an individual and to a community, the better for both. Right? That's just the realization of, oh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. A community which cannot bear and cannot survive such a crisis, which insists upon keeping its illusion when it should be shattered, permanently loses in that moment the promise of Christian community. Sooner or later, it will collapse. Every human wish dream that is injected into the Christian community is hindrance to genuine community and must be banished if genuine community is to survive. He who loves his dream of community more than the Christian community itself becomes a destroyer of the latter, even though his personal intentions may be ever so honest and earnest and sacrificial. The idea of Christian community, of what it should be, the Acts 2.42, and a heart to make, see that happen is good. But oftentimes, that very thing can be the thing that makes us judge every other person in the Christian community for not living up to the standard that we think should be set. You tracking? Like the, it destroys communities. It's why we, we leave the church when something happens that we just don't like, right? Something changes, the, the lights change, or JR starts hosting. Like, <laughs> I don't know why I said that. I'm leaving. I'm, I'm over it. You know, like, it, 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 and it's, we laugh, but like, I've had people leave for less. <laughs> you know, like, pe people leave over the smallest things because there's this ideal, which might not be wrong, but it crushes the people. All right, we've got a couple more. Connectivity. Connectivity. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because that's what this whole month, two months, has been about, right? We're more connected than we've ever been, but we're the loneliest we've ever been. Is there not a correlation there, right? Andy Crouch, who does the TechWise family, he says it this way. Technology in its proper place when it helps us bond with the real people we have been given to love. It's out of its proper place when we end up bonding with people at a distance like celebrities whom we will never meet. We use technology to be connected when in reality we only have a gauge of relationship that's around 100 to 150. And if you're like, oh, that seems like a lot, then imagine having a thousand people follow you and you're checking their feed every day and you have to know what's going on. And you have to know what's going on with so-and-so you haven't seen for 30 years, right? Like you weren't built for that. We're not built for that. And so our connectivity actually becomes an issue for the real relationships, the face-to-face -face relationships. I heard a quote recently that said, a face-to-face -face conversa conversation is the most human and humanizing thing we can do. So the most human thing we can do is have a face-to-face -face conversation. That's why I'm kind of like a robot, because I'm not very good at it. But it's the most human and most humanizing thing we can do. To love the community well is just to have a conversation, face-to-face -face conversation. The next one is friendship. And this is, this is interesting because you're like, friendship, that should be in the heart of community. And I got to make the distinction here because friendship and community are two different things. Now, sometimes they overlap and that is a sweet season. When your community you have are also some of your closest friends, it's awesome. But that's not how it goes a lot of the time. You're, I have friends in Vegas who I'll go visit them We'll go to In-N-Out, and I'll have a great, like, we'll just laugh and tell stories, and they know me, like, they know my personality, and we have a good time. But I'm not sharing with them the struggles I'm going through. 
I'm not telling them, God, this is where I'm, I'm sensing God move in my life. I'm not like, hey, let's, let's, take, let's take some time to pray, and, and I just want to invite you in this with me. We're not serving shoulder to shoulder together. They're my friends. I'll go hang out with them. I might spend a weekend with them. We'll go on vacation together. That's great. Game night at my house, awesome. But the community of God is, is, is just different. It's, it's the people that God calls us to, to be in relationship, to be committed to, no matter what. It's the koinonia, the Greek word. It's a fellowship. Common people. A sharing. And in Acts 2.42, their commonality is Jesus. That's the thing we all share. C.S. Lewis puts it like this. Friendship is that moment where you say, you too, I thought no one else. It's that moment where you have that connection where you're like, oh, we're on the same page about this. You like Star Wars? Oh my gosh, I like Star Wars. Oh, it's so great. What's your favorite one? You like In N Out? Yeah, it's the best hamburger ever. I know. Let's look great. Oh, let's go. Pickleball? Yeah, I'm down. Let's go play pickleball. I'm just kidding. I've never played pickleball. I never will. Um, <laughs> whatever that is, that's friendship. Community is you've been saved by grace. Me too. Let's do this together. It's different. And when they're together, it's awesome. But a lot of time, they're not. So, like, here's an example. I'm going to help this for Jen Smith. Community groups here at Church of the City. A lot of times, we want to jump into a community group thinking we're going to find, like, Ross Chandler and Joey and find our friends that we've been missing out on. And those are our people, and we're going to be with them forever. That's just not it. That's not the case. I hope you find really good friendships here. I truly do. But I would way rather you find a community where you're known and belong than the friends. I want God to meet you with friendship, but I want you to find the community that you are known, that you are known in and you long for. And so when we say, come join a community group, it's not like speed dating. It's not like find your friends. It's, you know, join community, whatever it looks like. Last one. Last challenge to community, and this is the heart of them all, is fear. It, it's the natural fear to just put ourselves out there. It's what silence and solitude and community have in common. Because in silence and solitude, you're, you're bare before God. He sees all, and you're just exposed with him. God, search my heart. And it takes courage to show up to the throne of grace. Community is the same. When we're really doing community, we're showing up with our true self. This is me. These are my struggles. This is where I need prayer. This is what I'm going through. Our, our families, they see the truest version of us, right? They see the, the best of us and the worst of us. And community is, is supposed to be like that. Where we see the best and worst of each other. And by the grace of God, a miracle of God we're committed to one another, no matter what. That's community defined by Jesus. And it's scary. Hmm, which one do I want? Rich Villauda says it this way. We are wounded in community, and we are healed in community. No way around it. Healing might not come from the community where the wounding took place, but community is needed for healing none the less so many of us have come from other churches. Maybe you moved here. So many of us have wounds from communities, from churches. Maybe we just have our own wounds from our own families. And the idea of trusting people is like the last thing we want to do. And that's why in Hebrews when it says, you have a great priest who can sympathize with your weaknesses. That in his rejection... He showed you a way forward to not give up on community, even though it's hard, even though it might be painful. But maybe God wants to heal those wounds to the community. Maybe it's the exact community that wounded you, or maybe it's not. But it's got to happen all the same. And that's the reality we have to face this morning. Jesus Right before he left, before we get to Acts 2.42, 42, 
He told the disciples this in John 13, 34 to 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus says how you love the community. Like, Jesus is talking to the 12, right? He's just saying to them. John, how you love Peter. Matthew, how you love Simon. That's how the world's gonna know about this thing. The kingdom of God is gonna break through on how you love one another that you disagree with, that you're mad at, that have wounded you, but you've shown through a miraculous level of commitment and service and love that you're in no matter what. That's how the world will know the gospel. It's the, the life you live in community is the greatest sermon you'll ever tell. It's what Jesus has called us to. I'm gonna have you guys get your communion elements ready. We're gonna do a little bit different this morning. I just wanna tell you one quick story and we'll go to communion. In 2021, in 2020, community for all of us, just, it just took a, it got hit with a bat, right? Just looked way different. Total shift. In 2021, for me personally, the people that I would say were in my community, a good majority of them, there's still lots of people here that were in my community, but a good majority of the people that I was, I was closest to, I was most committed to, just disappeared. All different reasons, they were gone, like in an instant, within months. And what that did for me and my wife was it just made us kind of close up. It was, just me, it was just me and her and the kids for a while. And we needed that time to heal and process, and it was, it was good, but it was way longer than I wanted it to be. And I was sitting one day, this is probably, yeah, end of 2021 or, or somewhere around there. I was, I was in this space where I was like, why won't, why won't anyone come and find me? Like, I need somebody to search me out and welcome me back in. I need somebody to seek me out for community. And it was like the Holy Spirit just got my attention. It was like, why are you waiting for someone? Like, you need to go out. You need to invite people in. The thing that you're longing for, so is everyone else. You want someone to invite you in, so is everyone Everyone else is waiting for the invite. So in that moment, I was like, okay, I gotta step out. I gotta do this again. Put myself back out there. Willing to get wounded again. And I just started to invite more people into my life, into our family, and to be in our community. And so the other day, and just I have this picture from the other night. We were celebrating some small group leaders, and these are a couple of I can't cry again because I cried at Senior Sunday, and it was, it was a lot. Okay, so um, these are a couple of guys that I've just invited in to community, and. It is kind of that sweet spot where we're friends and community, and so it's, it is special. And there's more than just these, these three dudes, but it was a moment for me to recognize, man, like I, I went out and I, I just wanted to find it, and God brought it to me. And so my invitation for you all is just to step out and be willing to get hurt again, as, as, as hard as that sounds. Be willing to step into community. And I know it's like summer season and literally everyone is going to go every which way and, and we're going to even slow down things here at the church. But what would it look like for you to just find a couple people and just say, we're gonna, not online, not on FaceTime, like in your neighborhood, like you can go meet at their house, you meet here on Sunday, whatever, like you meet with some people, a couple people. Every week, every other week, you make it work. You commit to one another and you just do the simple things. You eat a meal. What, what are you going through? What are your struggles? What can we pray about? How can I serve you? Just like the basic stuff. And what would God do in that? 
if we would just do that with one another. So here's what we're going to do with communion. I want you to just circle up with people around you. And you're going to take communion together just in the community. And you might not know the people that you're sitting with, but I want you guys to, like, church is not just sit in a chair and, and listen the whole time, even though that's what we did a lot of today. Like, break into some groups and we'll take communion together. All right, so just do what you got to do. Move around if you have to. If you have like a huge family, maybe you do it just as a family, but if there's some people around you you can just take communion with, it's really simple. Body broken, blood shed. You guys could just take communion on your own. Somebody can pray. Right where you're at. Go ahead. Grace and peace. If you are heading out, we love you. We'll see you guys next Sunday. If you guys want to linger and have conversation, go for it. No rush.
shining through. Calling on my friends, asking what's the move. Feeling a little different, I'm on something new. Today, today. I ain't gonna let no clouds get in my way. The only road I'm walking is the one I pay. Catch me sitting in the sun, no top of shade. Today, today. Ooh. This is the day that the Lord has made. Ooh. And I ain't gonna let it slip away. I'm gonna be joyful. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'm gonna be joyful. Today, I'm gonna be joyful. Ooh, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna, gonna be joyful. Uh, I got the feeling that you get when you get new kicks. Bell ringing on the last day of singing, yeah. High five and everybody, but we out of here. Don't take it as a choice, but you gotta know that today's the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. And I ain't gonna let it slip away. Nah, I'm gonna be joyful. I got the joy, joy down in my heart.